The Gospel of John chapter 1 and verse 17. We are continuing our exposition on what's known as the prologue of the Gospel of John. Uh, his prologue is his introduction to the rest of the Gospel. And this prologue contains in succinct and summarized forms uh, a number of the themes, in fact, all of the major themes that are found later in this book. And so they come here summarized to us, and the Apostle John, as he continues in this gospel account, will revisit these th themes even as he explicates them in greater detail. But since we're dealing right now with this prologue, which is of an introductory nature, and since it is foundational to our understanding of the rest of the Gospel of John, uh, it is important that we detain our rapid progress in this Gospel uh, for a number of Lord's Days in order to visit these truths and to consider them uh, in a somewhat careful manner so that we can have a firm understanding of these things and lay this groundwork appropriately that we may then, then build upon them as we progress and take larger portions of text uh, in the rest of our progress in this gospel account. So verse 17, the inspired and perfect word of God says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So what if you went up to the typical man on the street in America today, in our increasingly secularized culture, and you told him the traditional message of modern evangelism. You told him, you can have a relationship with God. You can enjoy a relationship with God. You can have such a relationship. Because that's been the message of much of modern evangelicalism for the better part of the 20th century. Or what if you told them even a bit worse, God wants to have a relationship with you as if God were at the mercy of man in order to have such a relationship? How would such a man respond if we were to posit to him such questions or such offers? I think the typical man in our culture would say, uh, I don't have a relationship with God. I don't really want a relationship with God and I've been quite fine all these years without such a relationship with God. Just fine without Him. We know that that kind of autonomous self-sufficiency and practical atheism is indeed sinking our globalist culture down to the depths of hell. It truly is. But the fact is, that there is something inherently flawed in such a message. God wants to have a relationship with you. There is something flawed with that message because it puts man in the driver's seat and it subtly communicates the idea that the Lord God Almighty is at the beckoning call of man. Scripture everywhere teaches that it is man that is at the mercy of God, not that God is at the mercy of man. And that can be a subtle difference in the communication of such a message. But nevertheless, it is the impression that many are sadly left with as they are evangelized by modern evangelicalism. Now the fact is, rather than telling people that they can have a relationship with God, we need to be telling people that they do have a relationship with God, whether they recognize it or not. Everybody has a relationship with God. Nobody lives an entirely godless life in the sense that they live entirely of their own accord with no providential governance of God, with no lordship of God being exercised over them, and without God's divine prerogative being exercised in that and the whole dynamic of that relationship. They might not recognize God. They might be in utter and total rebellion against God. But God does reign and He is God and Lord of all. He is. 
And one of the important reasons that Scripture gives for the fact that everybody is indeed in relationship with God is due to the fact that God is the God of the covenant. He is the God of the covenant. He has no relationship with any man anywhere except by way of covenant. And the Bible teaches that all men stand in covenant relationship to God. And so we need to be telling people that they do have a relationship with God, whether they recognize that or not, but that that relationship by default is one in which they stand related to him through a broken covenant of works. They stand related to him covenantally in Adam. And as Adam is what we call their federal or covenantal representative head, they stand before God as fallen creatures. And they are required according to the terms of the covenant of works in which they stand related to God to render perfect, absolute, and unflinching obedience to all His holy law. And God has unequivocally declared in His Word that cursed is the one who does not continue in all the works written in the book of the law to perform them. So in Adam we all stand condemned. We have both a guilty record and a corrupt heart. And only in Christ can we receive from His fullness what Calvin called the duplex gratia, the twofold grace of justification by which we receive the forgiveness of sins and sanctification by which we are internally renewed into the image of God. Only in Christ can we receive that grace. The Gospel holds out to us the offer that we may have our covenant relationship with Adam judicially absolved by the death of another so that we may then pass and enter into a new covenantal relationship with God, even a new covenant of everlasting grace and salvation. In other words, we may pass from a bad relationship toward God to one in which God declares us mercifully to be accepted in the beloved. So the question is not whether you have a relationship with God. The question is whether you have a good relationship or a bad relationship with God. But everyone has a relationship with God and all have to do with the great one who rules the world. And since God always operates by way of covenant in his relationship with man, the fact is that the Bible, the whole history of the Bible, is the story of the covenant. Even when God made man, not only did he enter into a covenantal relationship with man by his merciful condescension, what we call the covenant of works or the covenant of creation, But God also ordained that the most intimate relationship that would exist between human beings, namely the intimate communal bond of the marriage of a man and a woman, which is the very foundation of society, the backbone of the family is the foundation of society, of God's society as He established it in our world, God ordained for that relationship to be one of covenant. Covenant. And so covenant is very front and center as the foundation of society. It's very prominent in human relations. It's very prominent in all of God's dealings with the world. And again and again, God of His own sovereign initiative and gracious love, He enters into covenant after covenant with man. Not only the Adamic covenant, but also the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant with the Levitical priesthood from the line of Phinehas, the Davidic covenant, and even the new covenant. Time and time again, God is by His own accord, according to His own mercy, entering into these covenant relationships with man. 
even our Bibles themselves are fundamentally uh, divided into two parts. What we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. Or properly speaking, the Old Covenant canon and the New Covenant canon of Scripture. The very construct of covenant does definitively determine the very structure of the canon of the Word of God as that comes to us. So covenant can be seen all over the place in God's dealings. And in our text, the Apostle John, as he introduces us to the message of the gospel, he does so by framing that message within the context of God's covenantal dealings with man. And the central message of this text is that Jesus Christ is the great consummator and perfecter of all of God's covenantal dealings. We've spoken of a manifold glory of Christ that is disclosed in this prologue to John's Gospel account. Well, now we come to that distinctive glory of Christ as Christ is set forth as the great consummator of God's covenantal dealings. So the text says, we read it again, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So let me just state what the text means and then we'll put it in its context and seek to work through it to explicate it in more detail. And the sense is this, to offer a loose paraphrase of the text here. Through Moses was given the revelation of God, but Christ came to reveal God most fully and to secure salvation in fulfillment of all previous covenantal anticipation. And again, let me just repeat it so we don't miss it. Through Moses was given the initial, definitive, and very glorious revelation of God. For the law was given through Moses. That's genuine divine revelation. But Christ came to expressly reveal God most fully and to secure salvation in a consummate manner by His living and dying and rising again in fulfillment of all of God's previous covenantal transactions and as the full fulfillment of all that those previous covenantal administrations prophetically anticipated. Therefore, the law of Moses and the sense in which the Apostle is speaking of the law of Moses here in this text, is incomplete without Christ. And to truly honor the law of Moses, one must come to honor and receive and even worship and adore the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's important to consider here how the Apostle is using the term law as he refers to the law of Moses. Whenever we see the term law appear in Scripture, we need to ask ourselves in what sense is the term being employed? Because it's used in a number of different ways according to the broad semantic range of that term. Sometimes when the New Testament speaks of the law, it has in mind purely the moral core of the law as it was revealed on Sinai, summarized in the Ten Commandments. And as such, when the New Testament uses the term in that way, it's referring to the immutable, that is, unchanging moral law of God that remains the same in every epoch of redemptive history and is never subject to change. Never, never. Sometimes when it uses the term law, it's referring merely to a principle, an operative principle that is at work in an efficacious manner. The Apostle Paul speaks in Romans chapter 7 of the law of sin that remains in his members. Well, the law of sin there is not the moral law of God. God forbid that we understand that text to be referring to the moral law of God for the moral law of God 
is not tainted with any sin, nor does it have any favorable relationship toward sin. But the law of sin is the principle of sin, the operative, efficacious power of sin that does abide in our flesh and needs to be mortified. But sometimes when the apostle uses the term law, whatever apostle we have in mind, he'll be referring to the covenant of God in terms of the entire covenant that was revealed by God through Moses and made with the nation of Israel. And the sense in which the New Testament is using the term law depends on the context. We come to determine the meaning of the term according to the context in which it is found. And so I think here there are a number of indicators that demonstrate that what he says, the law was given through Moses, what the apostle is thinking of is not the moral law, but rather it's the law consisting of the entire covenant that was initially made at Sinai and then formalized with the people of Israel. This is the entire Mosaic law, the Mosaic canon, uh, the initial five books of our canon of Scripture, known as the Pentateuch or the Torah, that is in mind. The apostle is thinking of that covenant as revealed to Moses and as the rev- uh, of the revelation of God that was given through Moses. And so this is the covenantal relationship of God in the Torah, which is instruction for the people of God. And the apostle is here contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant. The old covenant was established with the people of God through Moses, but grace and truth in the most perfect consummate manner was established as it came by Jesus Christ, who ratified and established the new covenant with his own blood. And so what we have here in this text is a summary and a panoramic view, as it were, of redemptive history as a whole, as that history is broadly summarized in terms of this twofold covenantal administration of God. And so the law of Moses, broadly considered, can also be taken to to mean the scriptures of the Old Testament. The first five books, and as those first five books are foundational to the rest of the canon of the Old Testament that are incorporated as a part of that Old Covenant. And so if we put that in the context of the first and second centuries A.D., it's a very important point to be made. Very important. Because the Jews knew very well that they had been entrusted with the oracles of God, as the Apostle Paul said in the book of Romans, to them were confided or entrusted the oracles of God. And even as the Gospel of John itself later points out, the Jews were very insistent on the scriptures of Moses. As he later said to the blind man, you are that man's disciple, but we are Moses' disciples we know that god spoke to moses but as for that man we don't even know where he came from they would say and so they were keenly aware that moses was indeed a true prophet of god who spoke the word of god and through whom god revealed his covenant toward the people of israel And the accusation of many of them against the entire Christian movement, which no doubt the Apostle John had heard time and time again, was that the Christian church was guilty of deprecating the scriptures of Moses and the covenant made with Moses. You remember, that's why they stoned Stephen in the book of the Acts. They accused him of despising the temple and the traditions, the customs that Moses had handed on to them. In fact, that was the accusation that was charged against our Lord Jesus Christ himself, leading to his crucifixion. 
that he sought to change the customs of Moses, that he sought to abolish the temple, that he was promoting the destruction of the temple in favor of himself. And so, there were many Jews who were hardened in their determinate rejection of Christ and their excuse, the excuse for their hardening was that the Christian church stood in utter discontinuity with the revelation that was given through Moses and therefore was invalid. And so that's where the argument of John 1.17 comes in. Because it's saying, in essence, well, the law was given through Moses. We recognize, the, the apostle is speaking as representative of that apostolic band and as a Christian church of the whole, the Christian message. He's saying, we recognize the law that was given through Moses as the word of God, full of instruction, full of divine revelation. And we do esteem and love that law. But it's because of our esteem for that law and because of our understanding of that law and its proper place in redemptive history and its proper application to us. Because of all that, we are followers of Christ, of this Jesus of Nazareth, because Jesus Christ is the one who fulfills the law of Moses. He's the one who ushers in the salvation realities that Moses foretold. So the Jews, it would seem, incessantly accused the Christians of disdain toward the law. But then the Christians responded and they turned that argument on his head, you see. And they argued that it was the Jews who rejected Jesus as the Messiah who were the ones who were truly guilty of disdaining the law of God because they failed to embrace the grace and the truth that the law prophetically anticipated and that had become redemptive historical reality due to the historic introduction and consummation of the work of the God-man Jesus Christ. In the words of Jesus, who said to the very Jews of his own day who rejected him in John 5, 39 to 40, you search the scriptures for in them you think that you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Christ was the whole point of the scriptures. They were meant to point to him. Later in that chapter, verses 46 to 47, he tells them, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? True saving faith in God through the scriptures of Moses will lead to the conscious recognition and confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. If you don't believe in Jesus, you've missed the meaning and the intent of the scriptures of Moses. So in other words, what the apostle is alluding to here in Verse 17 of chapter 1 is this. Christ himself is the grand hermeneutical key that opens up our understanding to the Scriptures. I said he's the hermeneutical key. It might be somewhat of a complicated term for some, but let me define what it means. It simply means interpretive he is the interpretive key he is the one in the light of whose person and work we come to understand the scriptures who provides the entire interpretive grid through which the entire scriptures of the old testament may be properly understood 
With Christ, the book of God opens up to us. Without Christ, if we seek to read the Old Testament Scriptures without recognizing and applying to them the person and the work of Christ, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that such a Christless reading of the Old Testament is akin to reading the Scriptures with a veil over our eyes, blinding us to the truth of them. Christ is the great hermeneutical interpretive key. And children here, you might be familiar with those coloring books if you've seen them that come with the transparent marker. Have you seen those? There'll be these coloring books and they'll have the outline of all the figures uh, just in black and white outline. And they'll come with a little marker. And if you take that marker and open it up and try to draw on any other piece of paper, whether it be a notebook or a piece of computer paper or whatnot, the marker doesn't show up at all. It doesn't seem to draw anything. It's an invisible marker. But if you take that marker and you apply it to the special book that it came with and begin to color in those figures and those contours, all of a sudden, all of these vivid and bright colors show up. And what was previously black and white comes to evince itself in vivid color. What was previously mere outline comes to be filled in with substance. Well, Jesus Christ is like that marker. There was an initial and preliminary understanding, even a genuine understanding that the people of God came to through their reading of the Old Testament Scripture. If they read it right, but they saw it merely in terms of its general contours and black and white as it were. And Christ came along to provide the color and the substance to cause the text to truly come alive, to truly be transformative, to fill in all the blanks, to help us and cause us to understand it and its full significance and its full meaning. The Old Testament is the necessary book that comes with Christ. Now, many seek to understand Christ without any significant Old Testament background. And it's like they're taking that little marker and trying to draw a figure on a piece of paper that's not the special book that it came with. And their understanding remains unfruitful. But if we understand the person and work of Christ against the backdrop of the contours provided for Him in the Old Testament text, that is the way to truly understand and comprehend. And so the Apostle says the law was given through Moses as if to point us to the law that we would come to a proper and sound understanding of the law. That provides the outline. But he says grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And that's the substance and the color that's to dazzle the eye of faith with its beauty. The error of the Judaizers, of course, was that they failed to grasp the significance and implications of the prophetic and Christological anticipation of the law of Moses. I mean, how many untold hundreds and thousands of people completely aborted with regard to faith in the first and second centuries because they failed to understand how Christ fulfills the Scriptures of the Hebrew canon. The Apostle Paul would argue again and again that to revert back to the types and shadows of the Old Covenant once the Christocentric substance has come is to practically deny the reality of the substance in favor of the shadow. And it's a grave error. It's a grave error if we say that it's good to believe in the work of Jesus Christ and to deposit all of our faith and all of our hope into the bosom of the Son of God that we may be saved from Him. But in addition to that, we must be circumcised to be saved. That's a grave error. Or in addition to faith in Christ, we need to observe a Passover meal or we need to observe these old covenant uh, rituals and feast days and ceremonies and covenantal uh, ceremonial stipulations that pertained inherently to the law of Moses. 
because to revert back to that shadow is to practically insult the greater reality and glory of the substance now that he has come. It would be, I suppose, like a woman who was newly married and loved her husband with all her heart and he was truly her first love and in their youth he was separated from her and locked in some confinement camp, let's say under the totalitarian regime of some communist country. And she never saw him again for decades. And she would think day after day and week after week how she longed to see her beloved husband again and she held out to uh, faithful to him, hoping for that day to arrive. And then finally she gets a letter to show up as such and such a certain place and that he would be released from his confinement. And so she goes to the place and finally as he's released and she sees his face for the first time in several decades. And in the joy of it, she runs up to him and she circumvents him and falls upon his shadow and begins to kiss and embrace his shadow and to speak to his shadow. And then as the days and the weeks and the months go by, every time she speaks to him, she looks away from him onto his shadow and she speaks and communes with the shadow. Now what would such a man think? Would it not be an insult to the man? In the same way, to revert back to the shadow of the ceremonies that were peculiar to the old covenant administration, once the substance of the full, once the bridegroom has appeared on the scene, is to insult and practically deny the true presence of the bridegroom. And so it constitutes a basic practical denial of the sufficiency and fullness and glory of the gospel itself. And so there is a progression in redemptive history from the incomplete to the complete, from the law of Moses to the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. John 1.17 is a short and simple text, quite straightforward in its clear declaration and yet profound in its implications and sadly, often confounded in its interpretations. You know, there's a number of ways that this text has been traditionally understood. There is the disjunctive dispensational interpretation. Many of us have been exposed to that one. The old classical dispensationalists, like Schofield in his old reference Bible, would say that the law was given through Moses and that that in itself was the way of salvation as strictly considered according to its moral principle. And they would say that in the Old Covenant, men were saved by works, and in the New Covenant, were saved by grace. And so there is a disjunctive interpretation as if the Old Covenant is opposed to the New Covenant in Christ. And that's to completely confuse the whole issue, not to mention result in a false gospel as that gospel would have been understood uh, by the old covenant believer. Salvation was never by the works of the law. Salvation was never by man's own supposed obedience, which really is disobedience to the law. Others understand that in the antinomian way. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And that view interprets the first and second clauses of the verse as two antithetical or even contradicting realities. They say the law was given through Moses as if the apostle were saying it in a pejorative manner in order to disdain the law. The law was given through Moses, a bad thing, an undesirable thing. Something that's to be spurned. Something that we are to cast off. Something that we are no longer to look to for instruction in the will of God. Much less for ethics. And so it's viewed with antipathy. And the law is seen as problematic, even cruel. And they understand the grace and truth of Christ to come in that view to replace the law 
to abolish the law and to even abrogate the law in favor of something much better as opposed to what was formerly bad. Now, the Apostle John is not saying that the new covenant came to establish good grace in the place of a bad law of God. That's an entirely wrong way to interpret the text. In fact, if that were the interpretation of the text, it would have given sufficient ground to the Jews who opposed the Christian message, who accused them of disdain toward the law of God. And that was never the Christian message. Christians did not hold Moses in contempt. Moses was not the bad guy. Moses is the friend of Christ. Moses was faithful in all his house, in the words of Hebrews chapter 3. We have great esteem and respect for Moses. And it is that esteem and respect that drives us to Christ. That disdain, in fact, is nowhere confirmed in the rest of John's gospel. Moses himself is mentioned 13 times in the gospel. Never once is he insulted or despised. He's always appealed to normally in a favorable manner, that is. Uh, he is said to have written about Christ. He is said to be the judge who will condemn the Jews of that generation who rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Chapter 5, verse 45. And the Jews were even directly indicted by Jesus for failing to keep the law of Moses in chapter 7, verse 19. So it's definitely not that a bad law is replaced by a good covenant of grace and truth, but rather a very good law has been fulfilled by God's consummate manifestation of grace in Christ. And you know, the rest of the Bible militates against the antinomian view. This is important. Uh, this, this is important to mention because uh, this kind of interpretation is so popular in our day. I mean, there are even many Calvinistic circles who do affirm the doctrines of grace, but deny the ongoing validity of the law. And they read redemptive history as if there is a great disjunctive and antithetical element between the covenants that pose them against one another. The law was not against the promises of God. And the law itself, especially when it comes to the moral principles of the law, they are eternally binding and unchanging. Jesus said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Matthew 5, 17. Paul said in Romans 3, 31, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. The gospel honors the law, establishes the law, confirms the law, does not abrogate the law, does not cast out the law, does not disdain the law. In fact, in Psalm 40, verse 8, the Messiah Himself says, Thy law is within my heart. Isaiah 42, verse 21 says that in the times of the new covenant, that the Lord will exalt the law and make it honorable. Far from being disdained, it is magnified in the New Covenant. Even the law and its commanding imperatival moral core is according to Romans chapter 7 and verse 12, holy and just and good. And so if we're ever tempted to view the law pejoratively, we must recognize that that is completely out of step with the whole spirit and tenor of the New Testament not to mention the Old Testament and its inherent integrity. But there's another extreme. And the other extreme is on the other end of the spectrum as people approach this text. And it's the extreme that sees hardly any contrast in view at all. It's a view that flattens out the history of redemption. 
It says the old covenant of Sinai and the new covenant in Christ are essentially one and the same covenant, differing only in their mere external modes of administration. It says there are two administrations of the very same covenant. And it says that grace and truth belonged intrinsically to the old covenant and pertained to the very internal substance of that covenant as such. And with all due respect to our brethren who would hold such a view, we have to differ from it because we are persuaded that Jeremiah 31 and verse 32 speaks of a new covenant which is not according to the covenant that God made with Israel after the exodus because they continued not in His covenant but did violate it. It was a covenant that differed substantially in terms of its essence because while the old covenant of Moses admitted members who participated in that covenant and pertained to that covenant who were unregenerate, the new covenant does not admit any such member. There are no unregenerate members in the new covenant according to Scripture because all that pertain to the new covenant have the law of God written on their minds and in their hearts that they may delight to the law of God by the regenerating work of the Spirit of God. And so, new birth is a necessary condition for entrance into the life of the new covenant. And so, while there are elements of important continuity between the law of Moses and the new covenant, there are also important elements of discontinuity that need to be taken into account. And so the correct view of understanding this text and the affirmation of its two clauses is this. Not that the new covenant and the grace and truth of Christ repudiate the law of Moses, that would be antinomianism. And not that the grace and truth of the new covenant are the very same thing as what was already inherently found within the covenantal administration of Moses because that would be over much, over much continuity. But the correct view is that the grace and truth of the new covenant fulfill and bring into redemptive historical fruition and consummate perfection all that was preparatory and predicted and anticipated in the law of Moses. And so there are things in common with the law of Moses and the new covenant. And there are also things that differ. And we need to recognize both of those things. So what differed? What was it that differed? Well, I think in the words of John 1.17, it says, grace and truth. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The clear implication of the text is that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ in a manner in which they had not come through the law of Moses. Even in the words of Kelvin himself in his commentary, he says, we must recognize the antithesis. And while we would, we gratefully respect uh, Kelvin and uh, uh, we respect his view, but we would respectfully differ with him on his, the rest of his interpretation and application of that here. But he does say we must recognize the antithesis because there is something that is contrasted between the two clauses of this verse. Grace and truth came into manifestation through Christ in a way in which they had not existed as concrete, established, historical reality under the law of Moses. And the way to understand that is like this. If you want to accompany me to Romans chapter 3, I think this text is so clear. Uh, Romans chapter 3, a very important text in the New Testament. And we see how this dynamic works and plays out according to this text. Romans 
3 and verse 25, and it's speaking of Christ Jesus, whom God sent, set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness. It says, because in God's forbearance, He passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So what were the sins that were previously committed? They were all the sins of the Old Covenant saints who lived prior to the historic accomplishment to the, uh, of the work of Christ. All of those Old Covenant believers that truly did embrace the Gospel and sent their hope on the Messiah to come, God did not castigate and condemn them for their sins eternally, but He passed over their sins and laid them on Jesus Christ the Son. And so we can say by way of summary, according to that text, that grace in its operation and application was fully present under the Old Covenant. It, it operated and it was applied. It was truly there in that way. But it was not formally secured as an inherent part of that covenant. It would not be established and secured until the shedding of the blood of the Son of God. So grace was operative and applied, but not formally secured. Well, the question arises, was there grace and truth then under the law of Moses? The answer is yes, and I reiterate. It was there in revelation, and it was there in application. The grace of the gospel was revealed through the scriptures of Moses. And the Spirit of God did work to apply the benefits of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ to those Old Testament believers in anticipation of the work that Jesus would do. So it was there in revelation and application, but it existed under that epoch in what we call promissory form. That is, as promise, as anticipation. And so it was there in that sense but it was not yet there in the sense that it was not historical reality yet in terms of its formal securement. And that really is the message of the book of Hebrews, is it not? Uh, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The author there, chapter 11, contrasts new covenant saints with old covenant saints when he says that all of these Old Covenant believers, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, but God has provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And so grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And notice the language of the text. It says the law was given through Moses. It was given. Who was it given by? It was given by God. Moses was a prophet of God and he was constituted by God as an agent of special revelation. He was divinely inspired as he received and communicated the oracles of God. The law was given through him. Moses was a mere servant. But grace and truth itself as to the saving substance of the reality of God's omnipotent power brought to bear in the gospel. Grace and truth wasn't merely given through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, the text says. It came through Him. The language is specific. And it's specific in that sense, so as if to communicate that the grace and truth themselves are inherent in Jesus Christ. And that as Jesus Christ comes, the saving grace of God and the truth of God and the saving power of God all come with Jesus Christ. 
Salvation inheres in Christ. It is inseparable from Christ. It is essentially bound up in the person of Christ. And there is no salvation apart from Christ. And there is no receiving of the application of the redemptive benefits of Christ apart from being placed by the Spirit of God in vital union with Jesus Christ. And that's why he says, of His fullness we have all received and grace for grace because to receive the saving grace of God one must receive of the fullness of Christ and to receive of the fullness of Christ one must believe into Christ and be engrafted into Christ. And so the saving grace of God is not some abstract thing separable from Jesus Christ, but the saving grace of God is in Christ so that to receive grace unto salvation is to receive Christ. Verse 12, as many as received Him. And so the gospel of grace is set forth for us so clearly in this text is a gospel that is utterly Christocentric in its scope, in its nature, and in its message. It's Christ-centered. It's Christ coming to us clothed in the benefits of His gospel. And finally, just to point out one more thing that's so evident in this text. Those words, grace and truth, it wasn't the first time that they were ever used. The Apostle John, as he says, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, is actually referring back intentionally to Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6. And if you accompany me there in your Bibles, we can read that text together. Exodus chapter 34. This is the most climactic revelation of God that was given under the Old Covenant. The fullest, most glorious revelation of God was not at Mount Sinai per se and the giving of the Decalogue with the thunder from heaven and all that. But it's found here a bit later after Moses beseeched the Lord and said, show me your glory. And as the Lord caused His glory to pass by him, it says he proclaimed in verse 6, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses worshipped. John 1.17 is alluding to that specific phrase that's found at the end of verse 6, which says, abounding in goodness and truth. Abounding in goodness and truth. That word goodness that's used in Exodus 34.6 is chesed in the Hebrew. And it's a word that is notoriously difficult to translate for scholars. And so as you read that word translated in different English versions, they translate it in different ways. Sometimes it's translated as it often is in the King James and New King James versions as simply goodness or mercy. The ESV translates it as steadfast love. It's goodness and mercy because it communicates God's goodwill and kind intentions toward His people. It's translated as steadfast love because that translation excels in communicating the enduring, unfailing, covenantal character of this quality in God. The NIV often translates it simply as love, but that's really inadequate because it goes beyond that. The NASB is probably the most precise translation available in English right now of that word, which usually translates it as loving kindness. 
loving kindness, abounding in loving kindness and truth or faithfulness. That term suggests both God's love and His benevolent exercise of that love and acts of redemptive kindness on behalf of His people. But even that fails to express the full import of that term as it appears in the Scriptures. I think if I had to translate it, I would say covenantal loving kindness or perhaps steadfast covenantal loving kindness. And even though it's multiple words in English, you really do need multiple words to express the sense of that Hebrew word that appears over and over again all through the Hebrew canon. Covenantal loving kindness because this term refers to God's salvific benevolence by way of redemptive covenant. That exact phrase, in fact, goodness and truth, chesed and truth, covenantal loving kindness and truth, found in Exodus 34, 6, it appears over and over again throughout the Old Testament. The same phrase with the same syntax. Precisely the same, because when it occurs subsequently in the unfolding of redemptive history, those subsequent occurrences are referring intentionally to that definitive climactic self-revelation of God in Exodus 34. Psalm 25.10 says, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep His covenant and His testimonies. Or how about this one, Proverbs 16 and verse 6. In mercy, that's chesed, covenantal loving kindness. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And that's a big one there. In covenantal loving kindness, chesed, mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And that's what the heart of the Old Testament saint longed for, to see the actual concrete manifestation of that atoning reality by which he would be saved. And so the fact is, as God's grace was revealed in the Old Covenant, His chesed was so clearly testified to. And it's that construct of God's gracious covenantal dealings with His people that really does govern the whole of the Old Testament history. And so here's what I want us to see, and this is the point. As we consider the phrase goodness and truth, or grace and truth, as John 1.17 puts it, and we go back to the law of Moses and consider that phrase in its original context, it refers to God's covenantal loving kindness to redeem His people. In other words, it's a term that refers to His grace. His chesed is His grace as revealed through the context of covenant. It's His grace. And so when the Apostle John quotes it and alludes to that text in Exodus 34, 6, he simply says, grace and truth. And what he's saying is that that covenantal loving kindness and grace that God did in a preliminary way reveal to Moses and that glorious scene when He showed him His glory, that has come to full expression in Jesus Christ. The temporal covenant of Moses has given way to the everlasting covenant of grace. Shadow has given way to substance. Promise is given way to fulfillment. Anticipation is given way to realization. And demand has given way to satisfaction. And so Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And He's the end of the law in the sense of being the one to whom the entire law bore witness and to the, whom the entire law pointed. And so looking at this Exodus 34 text. Just notice one last thing and then we'll conclude. Notice the inherent tension that is present in the text. There is an inherent te tension that could not be reconciled fully in the mind of the Old Covenant believer. 
It says God is abounding in chesed, in goodness, loving kindness, and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But then it says by no means clearing the guilty. He does not clear the guilty. He punishes transgression and iniquity and sin. He will by no means clear those who are guilty. The soul that sins shall die. And so how is it that He abounds in grace and faithfulness? And yet, at the same time, He does not pass over sin. And yet, they've seen Him passing over sin. There is an unresolved tension that is inherent in the text and that cannot be resolved in the text according to its own terms. And that tension runs all the way through God's historical dealings with His people. How is it that God will forgive Noah's drunkenness and Abraham's lies and Jacob's deception and Moses' striking of the rock and David's adultery and Jeremiah's unbelief and despair? Hezekiah's pride and even countless iniquities and transgressions of countless people under that Old Testament dispensation. How is it that he will pass over them and forgive them and abound in grace and in mercy? And the answer, of course, is all in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That tension is fully resolved. Because God took the sins of that Noah, of that Abraham, of that Moses, of all those faithful, and He did lay the full accumulated weight and measure of those sins onto the shoulders of the Son as He bore them on that cursed tree. So as Luther said, God laid the sins of believers on His Son. And He said to Christ, I will treat you, be thou David the adulterer. Be thou Noah the drunkard. Be thou Peter the denier. And Paul the blasphemer. Christ, the words of Luther, was treated as if he were the greatest transgressor, murderer, thief, adulterer, rebel, blasphemer that ever was or ever could be in the world. And God said to him briefly, Be thou that person which hath committed the sins of all men. And see therefore that thou pay and satisfy for them. And he says, here now comes the law and saith, I found him a sinner. Therefore let him die upon the cross. And so he setteth upon him and killeth him, he said. And by this means, he said, the world is purged and cleansed from sin. Because Christ did truly bear it. Christ was treated as if the chief of sinners in order to resolve the inherent tension that is present in the Exodus 34 text and to consummately perfect the covenant and bring it into fulfillment of all that it promised. And so now all of the promises of God are in Him, yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through the Word of God. All that God has promised is brought into concrete reality in Jesus Christ. And in Him, mercy and truth have met together and righteousness and peace have kissed. And so the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Luther wrote to a friend and said, Learn to know Christ and Him crucified. Learn to sing to Him and to say, Lord Jesus, You are my righteousness. I am Your sin. You have taken upon Yourself what is Mine and given Me what is Yours. You became what You were not so that I may become what I was not. That's good advice. 